Welcome back for the final presentation, the formal presentation of the competition of ArcticFire2012.com, and we have saved the best for last. Um, Peter is about to give you a lecture on his original theory on the uh, design of medieval swords. I've, I heard the outlines of this theory, just the, just the bare sketches of them at the Ashokan Sword Seminar last fall, and it was, it was a moving event. Uh, we had uh, nearly 100, I would say, people in the room, and we, he got a standing ovation, the only one I saw in the entire festival. Um, it, it is an uh, inspiring uh, theory, and I think you're going to find it truly remarkable. And uh, I'm, I'm very thrilled that Peter has agreed to reveal this uh, to uh, all of us here at uh, Arctic Fire. Uh, so with that, I'm going to get out of the way and let you hear this. This is very great. The secret seal of the swordsmith. Peter? Thank you very much, Dave. So I'm really glad to be here and be given this opportunity to, to present this theory I've been working on for these past two years. Um, I work as a swordsmith. Um, I've been doing so professionally since uh, more than a decade. I base my work on documentation of originals and I've collected documentations since the mid-80s. Uh, before I started a career as a swordsmith, I was working as a graphical designer and illustrator. And in the training of this, you are basically initiated into the, to the tricks of the trade of the medieval scribe. Uh, the graphical designer is working very, very much according to the principles that were laid out in the making of medieval manuscripts with the uh, construction of grids for composition, the placing of the printed matter or written matter and, and the margins of the page, everything like this was, was old school already at the 13th century. So um, it is really a basis of, of modern design and has been a basis for design for quite a while. Uh, so when I turned to, to sword making, I had something of, of this thought pattern ingrained in me and I was thrilled to find in the swords when I when I went through my documentations that there are certain proportions that are that seem to be significant you can you can find uh, results of the golden section or root two proportions and this is a great help when you design a sword today because you can you can base uh, proportions on divisions of some other part with the help of a pocket calculator it's very handy and and gives you a uh, a door into the design results of, of medieval craftsmen. The thing is that what nagged in the back of my mind was that they didn't have pocket calculators in medieval times. So how could they establish these proportions? How, how is it that I, I time and time again find these things in swords? And it's been spinning around my head for, for oh, well, until this day, uh, a summer day for two years ago, when I by chance stumbled on something that uh, sent cold shivers down my spine because I, I thought I found a pattern. We should always be careful with patterns because they tend to be self-proving. You will tend to find what you're looking for. So this is something to be really aware of. If you, if you find a pattern, you better make sure that it's something that you can somehow correlate to other known facts, other kinds of patterns or methods that will be parallel to what you're um, looking for. So uh, I had to do a little bit of read up on medieval aesthetics and known design methods in the medieval period. And I will never, I won't pretend that I'm a, I'm a scholar in, in medieval design or, or medieval philosophy. But what I'm talking about in this presentation is making benefit of the research results of, of scholars in the field. Um, and uh, those I have on the medieval sword design, they are my own. But what I say about uh, ideas and philosophy of the medieval period is, um, is the result of research of others. We know that the medieval sword is, is a very charged object. We've talked about this 
time and time again these days um, of, of the, the hammering. It's it's a it's a power object. It's it's a very symbolical object, and it's always been that in every culture where the sword has been used. It's it is much more than just a weapon. It's it is a it, it is a result of the society it is made in. It's made for that society's warriors, and it tends to be an expression of that warrior philosophy or that belief system that the sword is made in. And I'd like to propose that the idea of what the conflict is about is as important for the design as our functional elements of metallurgy and, and craft methods or fighting methods. So if you have a, a concept of what the fight is about, it will tend to influence the design of the weapon. If you're fighting for your honor in a duel man to man, if you're in a cattle raiding society, um, if you're fighting to expand the empire, or if you're fighting to protect the church or, or the temple of your religion, the weapons you use will reflect your ideas of what the fight is all about. In the medieval period, we have a very specific setting. We have the medieval church who is, who is really sort of encompassing and, and going across all the nat nations. And is really one of the, well, the biggest mesonet of this period who, who organizes the building of cathedrals as well as, as putting armies in the field. Uh, so it has a tremendous um, uh, influence on, on, on many happenings during the medieval period. Um, and the philosophy... Oh, sorry. Thank you. So we need to see the medieval sword in this context. Um, the medieval sword changes its shape around the... Uh, 11th century. In this time period, this time span, it turns from being what looks like the we recognize as the Viking sword and becomes what we recognize as the medieval cruciform sword. And this coincides with other important happenings in, in European history and, and um, um, at that time. I won't go into that now because I will focus on, on the theory itself. Um, and I'd like to point out that this is very much uh, a work in progress. So those things that I propose now are intended to be an introduction to the idea. This is something that I'm, I'm still working on, and I hope to publish this in some kind of uh, context where it's possible to show more of the background material and much, much more of the details. The material it's, is, is much larger than this, but I hope you can get an idea of what it is I'm, I'm, I'm after. I'm jokingly calling this... Um, theory, the secret seal of the swordsmith, because um, as an allusion to the fact that many of the workings of, of medieval craftsmen were indeed under a seal of secret, uh, it was intended not to be spread about. It's something you teach your trusted apprentices and journeymen, uh, sometimes with a against promise of not spreading it further. And there was made a point of not writing down things because it was intended to be kept within a tight circle of those who are in need to know this. Um, so that is one reason that these ideas may not have left much trace in the historical material. We have to look at the artifacts themselves to learn about their making. We can study them from a point of archimetallurgy, we can study them from, from a point of, of swordsmanship. But strikingly enough, this medieval sword has not been studied in the same way as, say, medieval art or architecture, as a result of some intellectual processes or, or philosophical uh, foundations. And I do believe that this is a crucial thing if we're going to understand this, this object. In the medieval period, uh, there, was a, th there were ideas about the creative process. And this is not just about the creation of 
the world around us, but uh, the creative process of the artisan or artist. Uh, in around 1200, a um, poet, Joff of Vinsov, wrote that, let the mind's interior compass first circle the whole extent of the material. Let a definite order chart in advance at what point the pen will take up its course. As a prudent workman, construct the whole fabric within the mind's citadel. Let it exist in the mind before it is on the lips. And this, I think, is a beautiful quote. Uh, this is a man, a, a poet, who is writing about the act of composing literary work. How to make a poem, how to write a novel. And we can note that he's using the architect as an image for the creator, for the maker, for the artist, who is carefully planning his work in a way that it com it's complete in his mind before actually making this. And this is a process that is not strange to anyone who is involved in, in creative uh, activity because you, you make the object time and time again in your mind before you actually commit to physically making it. And sketch paper, um, um, forest walks, are helps in this to focus your mind and and and, and spark your your creative energy. It's also worth noting that he's talking about the mind's interior compass as something that is evident, a tool that is evident for design and planning and and creative activity. Um, in the medieval period, it was recognized that. Reality consisted of number and measure and weight. These were sort of three fundamental aspects of creation. And these are also indeed three aspects in sword making that are crucial to, to observe. Um, they will reflect in the proportions of the sword and its mass distribution that has a direct effect on how it is behaving in motion, how it reacts on impacts, and how, with what kind of precision and timing the swordman can use it as a fighting weapon. And this ties in with my presentation yesterday about sword dynamics. So the, a swordsmith, a sword maker, have to be familiar with with uh, the concepts of, of, of mass and how it uh, affects the sword. They may define it with different concepts than I presented them with, but the end effect was the same. Um, we also have something that is crucial in the medieval sword, and that is its proportions. This may be e easy to overlook because it's so taken for granted. The sword is a sword, it's cruciform. And how, how difficult can that be? It's a straight, symmetrical blade, a cross guard, and a pommel, and you know, that's it. It's a simple, crude weapon compared to many others, but there, there's one wrong in that saying, and that's it's, it's crude, because it's anything but. It has a subtlety in its design that is very, very easy to ignore. Uh, there's a structure to its proportions that is often there if you, if you just care to look for it. Like, um, the sword can be seen um, as being designed with, with modules. Three parts in the grip and pommel makes for four parts in the blade, uh, in the guard, and indeed the same module goes in an even number also in the complete length. Uh, so this may lead us to the conclusions that, that medieval swordsmiths used a modular system in designing of the swords. That may be so, but I believe there is even more to it than that. Uh, because modules can be the result of a completely different approach as well, which I will come to later on. Uh, the idea of macrocosm and mi microcosm was uh, very strong and influential in, in um, medieval times. It was the idea that the whole of creation, um, the, its structure and its proportions could be recognized also in its smaller parts. Uh, the, the creation of, of humankind, the, the, the body of mankind, is in one way an image of the universe. And we know that it was said that man was created in the image of God even. So this is almost like a medieval version of, of our thoughts of, of um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Fractals. Yes, it's a medieval image of the fractal, how, how something is repeated in every scale, if you keep zooming in or zooming out, you will keep see the same patterns repeating time and time again. And 
um, this is something that we can recognize in, in medieval engineering and art. Uh, in the case when medieval persons had any kind of education, this education tended to be organized in the several, seven liberal arts, um, composed of the first, the, the ground course, the trivium course, which is the, the trivium, which is the, the, um, the foundation, grammar, the structure of language, we have rhetoric, which is the structure of argument, and dialectics, or logic, which is the structure of thought. And when you've covered this, you could go on to the quadrivium, which is the, f the four ways uh, of further thought. Uh, arith arithmetic, which is a very important part. This is not s straight mathematics, as we would think. It's more mathematical theory. It's the power of number. It's the, their, their essential nature more than methods for calculation. So it's, it's number theory more than anything else. Um, but this also, of course, led to, to uh, studies in mathematics. But arithmetic to the medieval uh, scholar was to understand the nature of number. And this is important to understand. Um, and I'll come to that later as well. Then number can be applied in space and we get geometry. Number can also be applied to time and we have music. And finally, number can be applied in time and space, and we get astronomy. So it's a way to understand structure um, in the guise of number in different applications. Uh, this created a system of thought. Uh, th it was tools, intellectual tools to understand uh, reality and uh, the imaginary, or if you like, th the mystical thought. And geometry was one of the more important tools in this. Together with, with the power of numbers, this was perhaps the two primal tools in, in searching for an inner meaning of things, because this was something that was acutely important to medieval persons. The world was created by God according to a plan, according to a blueprint, if you like, according to set rules. And these rules were followed by him in creation. So. Creation was a rational construction, and you could look for the rational patterns in, in creation and understand not only how creation came together, but perhaps even some kind of the intentions of the supreme being. The holy scriptures were also sort of studied in the same way, looking for number, looking for the symbols of geometrical forms. And we have um, the Platonic um, forms of the equilateral triangle, triangle signifying the number three and three-ishness, but naturally also Holy Trinity. The, the number four is the square, and this was justice, equality, uh, stability, and uh, could be the foundation stone of the temple, it could be the frame of the universe, it could be the four evangelists, uh, everything that needed a, 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 an element of stability. You have a mystical number, the quintessential number five, which is the, the wounds of Christ. It's also the number that stands for, for protection. Um, the number six is a perfect number. I won't go into that because I'm not knowledgeable about the, the philosophies of, of Pythagoras, but it goes back to Greek philosophy. Um, it's also the days of creation, and it was said that six is not a perfect number because it's the days of the work in creation, but God chose to create wor the world in six days because it's a perfect number. So he followed logical rules to make the world a, a, a rational place. Uh, Number seven is an odd one, but it's also the, 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 the number for wisdom. It's the number of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's the seven virtues. It's also a complete cycle, the complete week. Uh, number eight is the first day after that first week. It's the new beginning. It's also uh, the shape, the octagon is the shape for the baptismal font. It's also the shape of the, of the chapel made for martyrs or for um, um, s saints, uh, and, and um, it's, it represents also resurrection. So eight is a very important number. Nine is three times three, three 
thrice holy, so of course it's, it's a, a very important number. It's the uh, number for the hierarchy of the angels and many other things apart from that. Ten is the sum of, of everything. It's, it's the number of the universe. Within ten are all the numbers there is. So it's a completeness. So because of that it represented um, uh, the universe. So when, when you go into a, to a medieval cathedral, you will see these ideas reflected in the in the architecture, the the the, the numbers of arches in windows, the numbers of the columns, the very dimensions of the church will reflect this, um, and the lady geometry that I had in the last image here, she was the 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 harsh lady of this art of geometry. She would set up the rules and the strictures for this line of thought. But in a way, she is also a muse. She inspires a special kind of beauty. Mathematicians can recognize a beauty in a mathematical formula. And likewise, you can recognize a kind of beauty also in these very strict and harsh geometrical structures. And they can be seen as the root of a cathedral that the cathedral grows out of. Um, I'm very happy to be able to show you this image because uh, by permission, kind permission by Professor Robert Bork, who's done the work of going to archives looking at surviving parchments of architectural drawings from the medieval period. And he's, he's looked at them from a specific uh, point of view. He looked for the marks of the draftsman. He looked for pinpricks in the parchments from the compass and uninked construction lines. And they are there to be found. This is strange because there's been one and a half century of quarrel among architectural historians where the geometry was an important part for Gothic construction or not. It might be a byproduct, who knows? But by his work we can now be fairly certain that it indeed is the backbone of the design. And from his work we can even see some, something of the development of the design, which forms give which others. So you may note here that you can see the square, the circle and the octagon are very prominent parts in this design. And it's a, it's a repeated pattern of, of uh, the same dimension going up the tower. And the individual parts are defined by geometric cuts through these forms. Where lines cross, where circles can be um, drawn, you will find the lines that form uh, the outline of the parts of the church. And this is something that is very crucial to medieval design uh, principles. That is, it is the proportion, it is the driving factor. It's not the actual dimension. Today we're very, very much focused on dimension on things because we have standardized dimensions. They did not exist in the medieval period. You had to work and set up your own standards and your own strictures to have a foundation. Because of that, geometry was almost a magical tool because you could construct something precise out of chaos. With, with, a, with two pegs and a piece of string, you can draw a perfect circle, uh, a thing that by itself is both very rational and completely irrational. It involves whole numbers but also the number pi. So it is just by drawing a circle you encompass both the rational and irrational part of, of creation. And I think this was recognized by medieval artisans. Uh, the design of medieval objects carry through in this, that they are built with an eye for proportion. So we can look at these two swords and note that their overall proportions are strikingly similar. The proportion between hilt and blade and complete length are identical between these swords. In parts they differ naturally, but the overall design of them is identical. But their actual size is very different. In real life, one sword is hardly even the blade length of the other. So we, it's very difficult to understand the size of a sword just from seeing an image of it. This is a classic situation for, for us swordsmiths today. If we base our work simply on the printed image in a, in a catalogue, we are bound to make mistakes because it's very difficult to get an, a, a true understanding of its actual size just from, from, from an image. Um, and 
this takes a little bit of, of backwards thinking for us today because we are so focused on dimension. So how wide is the blade? How long is the grip? By itself, not in proportions to, to everything. And, and just rest your mind on, on that difference for a while because this is a key element in this desi design theory. We can see how important for the creative mind in the medieval period if we Covilada uh, Onancourt. In this ice in the with the help of a pentagram. Because the number of five, as we know, is the number of the wounds of Christ, but it's also a sign of protection and perhaps blessing. Uh, in, the, in the tower, in the gate over that, um, or the, rather the roofing of the gate of that little castle, you can also see a pentagram. The roof and the gable together is a pentagram. And of course you want the gate to be protected, so that's why you put a pentagram over the door. Um, geometry was even used in discussions of moral philosophy. Clemens of uh, Alexandria was one of the early church fathers, uh, a converted heathen, and he said, righteousness is quadrangular. And to us this sounds like gibberish, because we don't have that relationship to the square and the number four. But to someone in the medieval times who had some, time, some kind of schooling, it, it was a very powerful saying. It made all kinds of sense in a way that is much, much larger than just this simple saying. It gives you a lot of associations to the scriptures and to the thoughts of the construction of reality. So this just goes to say how fundamental geometry and symbolical thinking is to the medieval mind. We need to understand this. For us it's a bit alien. But this was the way you understood reality. This was how you related to concepts and ideas. And the circle, of course, is the preeminent form. The na I should go back with that one. The nature of God is a circle of which the center is everywhere and the circumference is nowhere. This is the same of a Greek philosopher, but it's repeated in the Roman de la Rose, which is a mystical poem, an allegor allegorical poem about physical love, actually, written in the 13th century. Uh, the circle is also the, 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 the perfect device for the geometer or the, the one who is doing geometrical drawing. It also can be used to construct the two circles where that intersect through each other's midpoint. And this can be seen as the symbol of the Lord's dominion of heaven and earth in perfect union. Um, it's, uh, it, 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 it leads to the construction of the Vesica, which is this very specific almond shaped. It's also known as the Mandorla. The Vesica was a, a symbol for the early Christians. It's also the shape of the halo around Christ in heaven, Christ in majesty, and the throne of heaven. It's also significantly the shape of the halo around Mary, mother of God, the, the, the celestial virgin. Exactly where the two worlds meet, you have the Vesica giving birth to Christ and thereby completing creation. In geometrical drawing, it's a way to construct a perfect right angle between two lines, and also the cross, and the equilateral triangle. The Vesica gives birth to Trinity. So this is really a prayer in geometry. A pretty profound thing, actually. And I don't think this was something that just went without notice in medieval, within medieval mystics. This was the things they contemplated on. This was the things that inspired them in, in inner thought and, and prayer. And it's interesting to see how medieval engineering and planning of artwork goes hand in hand with medieval philosophy. That the tools that are used for practical layout of plans 
are also the instruments for mystical thought. And they recognize this nature of rationality in the creative act. And it reflected back on each other in a very profound and rich way. The drawing of circles can be used to divide a line in equal parts. As long as you can draw the next circle passing through the middle of the last one, you know you keep the circles constant. Dividing the line in ten parts, or with ten circles, can represent the ten commandments. If you draw the square around one of the circles, you also include the concept of righteousness and stability and possibly strength. And topping this off with the equilateral triangle, you give it a blessing three times. Well, you understand. And this gives a, a form that has a very specific inherent proportion. If you draw a line from this corner of the square past the corner of the triangle, it will meet exactly at the end of the ten circles. So it becomes a very interesting and powerful whole. And this is the basis for the design of a sword. And doing this, you do something that is important. When the parts are arranged in this way, they all combine into the whole, so that out of all the parts, there emerges one single wholeness of things, which is sort of the quintessential idea of creative, creative activity in, in medieval times. Be it philosophy, engineering, um, science, art, or craft. This is, this is the idea. Everything should fit to its neighbor in a harmonious way so they make sense in the whole. And you don't complete a work of art or anything unless it follows these principles. This is how they think. This is how they act. This is how they, they make priorities in choices. So it will inform the artist, it will inform the craftsman, and using geometry as a, as a creative tool, for us it seems alien because we are used to the measurements and grids we get from the CAD screen or, or the, the school ruler. We, we don't construct our own parameters by geometry. We, we never have to because we can buy gridded paper. So think away all those things and think that you, you're striving to establish things that have an inherent harmony and a completeness in themselves. This is the goal of the medieval artist. It is in one way a sacred activity and the making of a sword is no trivial matter because the sword is used by the knight who is a sworn protector of the church to fulfill the intention of the creator by be willing to sacrifice his life in pretty bloody deeds. But, and this was very filled with conflict already in the medieval times, but it's a fact. So if you make a sword in medieval times, it's better meet these intentions. Or it's almost like a sacrilege. I mean, this is a sacred endeavor this knight is going to do. Uh, and this is an uncomfortable thought to us uh, today, perhaps, but it was reality in medieval times. And we need to understand that if we're going to fully appreciate the symbolic impact a sword has, what it is really carrying. We are said that the sword is an image of the cross, and, well, in one superficial way it is, but you, you don't see the sword being used as a crucifix in medieval art. You don't see that. Never. So I don't think the fact that the sword has a cross god was the thing that made it into a holy artifact. No, what makes it into a, a very special tool, a very special weapon, is that its proportions are constructed from the same principles as you build a cathedral. It has an inherent wholeness of things. Um, this opens a system of design that, can, that is wonderfully flexible. By varying the number of circles in the overall definition of length and by the, varying the placing of the cross guard, you can have um, like a, 
natural um, point zero for your design. Um, you will note in these three designs that the guard is placed in the upper one in the middle of the circle, the next one it's in the middle of the vesica, and the last one it's just on the periphery of the circle. And this will naturally vary the proportion of, of the hilt to the blade. And I think I, I may suggest that the typical placing of the guard will vary over time in the development of the sword. So far, I, I think I see a tendency for the early swords to have the guard placed in the middle of the circle. If you think about it, these Brazil nut or circular pommeled sword with this rather the long guard in proportion to the short grip. It's a typical result of this kind of design grid. Because you won't draw the sword to just any scale in this grid. Imagine you, 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 you draw this actually on a piece of parchment or a, a plank with chalk on. I was going to do a drawing like that initially, but I thought this is that would take too much time. So I'll, I will have to sh show how you actually draw this with a compass and straight edge another time. You will have to take it for granted or, or trust me that you can, you can do these designs with very, very simple drawing tools. But once you've decided that, okay, the guard is in the middle here, you can then do subdivisions of the first square and circle and arrive at width of guard and width of blade, length of grip, size of pommel. And the same thing goes with the second and the third sword. But you will inherently arrive at slightly different types of designs from, from your basic layout. And they will all comply to this ideal of a single wholeness of things. Um, in the late 50, uh, 1400s, there was a goldsmith who wrote a handbook in Gothic design. That was very kind of him because it's one of the few. There exist a few of them. His name was Hans Schmuttemeyer, and he said that fundamentally this art is more freely and truly planted and developed out of the center of the circle together with its circumference, correct rules, points, and setting out. And if you think about it, that's exactly what you saw example of before of the center or the periphery of the circle, and then some rules of construction. And they are pretty simple. It's really like a way of playing chess or domino. If you have one thing, it can give you something else, not automatically something else. You have a creative choice to go one way or the other, but you do it by adding or cutting by certain specific principles. <clears throat> In his handbook, he presents a system of modules that are constructed from uh, a, a quadrature, which is rotating and inscribing a square smaller and smaller into itself. This gives you a system of modules where the first one may be based on a, a rational number, the second one will be relating to the root 2 and therefore be an irrational number, the next smaller yet again will be half the size of the first one and thereby a rational number, while the fourth one will be half of the second one and thereby again an irrational number. So they will flick back and forth between the rational and irrational in a completely absorbing way. Once you think about it, it's, it's this square it, within a square within a square, it's a rose. It's a rose of mystical insight, if you like. You know, you can go on on this and really build strange things out of it, and, and you should be careful not to, because we will reflect on these things slightly different than they did in medieval times, but it's surely inspiring, at least it is to me. Thank you. So, there exists a sword in uh, the Wallace Collection in London that happens to be a schoolbook example of this design method in application. I will show you. Uh, layout of seven circles, eight divisions of the line, you have the gift of wisdom, you have the promise of resurrection, and the guard of the sword lies squarely in the middle of the vesica of the first two circles. It gives us the first module with the second module and then the third module that gives you the front of the guard and the height of the pommel. Exactly! 
Exactly. We can go into greater detail and I'll show you. Um, you have the E module, which is a quarter of the A module. That'll give you, of course, the pommel height then and the front of the guard, as I said. Um, because it coincides with the C module as well, of course. Um, you can look for an application of the B module, which is the first irrational module, and that will give you nothing less than the height of the pommel and the length of the grip together, exactly, and thereby defining the inside of the guard. You've already drawn the front of the guard, now you have the inside of the guard. The F module is a quarter of the B module and it gives you the width of the pommel. Not the height of the pommel, but the width of the pommel. Maybe also the blade width. If so, they undershot the definition by a slight margin, which is quite possible. I mean, these are not astronomical instruments, after all. They are, they are swords. You don't have to make them with absolute exactness. But the, the, the fit to this pattern is striking, anyway. Um, I will show an alternative definition of the blade width a little bit later. Um, you have these, the E and F modules, they give the width of the, or the height of the guard, as I already said, and with them you can get the exact middle of the guard. But the width of the guard is not to be defined by the modules, not directly. But what you can do, you can take the compass and fold down the side of the square, and that arc will cut that midline exactly in the blade width, uh, the guard width. It's a very simple operation to do. It's one of the first things you try when you have the compass and the square in front of you. It's very readily done. Um, the H module, which is the smallest one in, in Schmortemeyer's system, happens to coincide with the flaring end of the arms of the guard. Again, we can look at the F module, and if we place it in a place where it's naturally defined by the... Uh, ju just like you can draw a series of circles down the length of the sword, you can draw a series of diagonal squares. So imagine you have the, the first square and the second square that will zoom in exactly in the middle of the vesica, and if you place the F module there, it'll give you that circle, inscribing an octagon in that circle, will give you exactly the blade width. This may be a coincidence, or it may be intentional. Perhaps they undershoot the width of the guard and it was supposed to be the F module. If they really went for the, the octagon within the F module, module, they are really playing a very subtle game here. Um, again, the F module is responsible for the width of the pommel. We saw that before. Um, it also gives you um, the octagonal outside of the, of the pommel, but also the neck of the pommel. If you draw an octagon star in that oct larger octagon, you will get the, the base width of the smallest part of the pommel. The actual shape of the, of the outline can be constructed with geometry from the grid you have already established. So this sword is really a schoolbook example of Hans Schmuttermeyer's design system set in, in action. The thing is, the sword is 80 years older than his book. But he says in the f initial the introduction to his book that I do this not to elevate my own uh, status, but to sing the praise of, of the old-timers who taught us this art. And we see that these principles were used in the design of cathedrals way, way before this. So this was already old by the 1400. Um, if we put our faith in this principle, we can actually use it to reconstruct a sword that is broken, because the parts that remain can contain the information we need to project the part that is missing. And I will show you how I went about this in an attempt to reconstruct a sword that was found in the river in my hometown, Uppsala. In the mid-1800s, they did work on the um, quayside um, uh, down the rapids where, where they, the bo boats anchor, or what do you call it? They don't anchor, but 
Dark, they dark, yes. Um, and they found no less than three swords during a day. And, and in the medieval period, this was the place where the king had a house or a manor. So it was a place of both economical, political and strategic importance. And the 1200s, when this sword is from, was a very turbulent time. There was a lot of warfare, there was a lot of, of uh, battles and, and fighting going on. So it's not a very un unlikely place to find swords. Uh, to me, this sword has always been very striking. It's, it's physically very big. It's a very, very broad blade. It happens to be this one. This is the reconstruction, the actual reconstruction I made. Uh, and I'll, I will walk you through step by step how I establish this precise form for it. If we look at the hilt of the sword that remains very well preserved, we may note that the pommel is exactly one third uh, of the length up to the guard. And the same measurement is very closely matched by the width of the guard. So this is interesting. Maybe we can look for a system of modules here. Um, so what, where does that put us? We could do simply like that, but it doesn't really seem to make sense. So we can make a multiplication of the smaller ones and perhaps add another large circle and well that sounds or sort of looks more reasonable. Um, now counting the smaller circuits they go three to one in the smaller and largest circles but they can also be divided into pairs, into twos, meaning we have a rhythm of two and four also in this structure. So we can, from this, construct a vesica pattern. Because the vesica cuts the square exactly in one-fourth. And as it happens, the middle of the vesica is exactly behind the guard of this sword. If we propose this length for it, naturally. Um, we can see how the proportions of the hilt support uh, a geometric uh, construction. This is again uh, the quadrature of the hilt inscribing the first uh, and second into the, the original square. We can see that the, the smallest of these squares will give you the height of the pommel exactly. The, we, we already know this. The second square, the diagonal square, look at that one. You notice how this touches upon the face, the mid-face of the pommel. So it's actually the, the, the circle that forms the mid-face of the pommel is actually a tangent to the sides of the diagonal square. If we now place a compass exactly in the middle of this structure and touch on the rim of the face of the pommel, we can fold this distance over to the front of the sword and that gives us exactly the front edge of the guard. And now we can do the simple operation of drawing diagonals across half the width of the square and that gives us the width of the guard. If we now do again what you saw in the previous sword, we take the side of the square and we fold it down so we get two diagonal arcs. When those arcs cut the midline of the vesica, we get exactly the blade width. It's interesting because the structure is both very intricate and strikingly simple. Once you're familiar with these operations of quadrature and diagonals and moving one dimension to another place with the drawing of a circle, it gets very natural. It's, it doesn't take a lot of effort to think these things out. Actually, you can play with it and see, just draw this circle, it will fit into the pattern of the whole. Does it really make sense here? No, well, I make another division instead. So it's not that it has to fulfill just one solution. This sword has to fulfill this solution to be what it is, of course, because they made these creative choices. But you can do many, many, many variations on this. Um, now we can see, if we compare the modular layout 
with the geometrical layout. We may note that, again, the smallest module, of course, goes evenly into the length of the uh, larger modules. But we can also see how the blade width happens to coincide with the total length exactly. This is something new. This is something we couldn't know before. But it so happens that when you do divide the midline of the vesica with these two diagonal arcs, you get a measurement that goes precisely 14 times in this established width. So it further, I think, reinforces this interpretation of the length. And the final sword, of course, well, these are photos of it, I can show you it's as well. I think you may get some close-ups of it. I don't know what is the best way to do it. It's a physically rather large sword. Uh, it is as if made to a very big man. Because, again, if you see just a photograph of it, it would be very difficult to understand its actual size. Um, but because of the things I told you about yesterday, about dynamical aspects of the sword, its balance, how it has to have its mass uh, distributed to be an efficient sword. If the outline is established, we can now get an understanding of the missing part from the physical dimensions of what survives. So I can then extrapolate what would be a probable thickness and cross-section of the part that is lost if the final balance is to be the same as you would find on a surviving example that is intact. So by, by, by observing dynamical aspects of the sword and its aesthetic aspects, we can get a more complete idea of what the medieval sword would have been about. And I will now end this with showing how you can apply these principles when approaching sword design without any asp aspiration to, to remake or replicate a historical sword, because these principles are just a tradition of the craft. We can relate to them or not to, we are completely free to do what we want, but it's possible to use them for sword design today. And I was interested to make a sword that would reflect on mis the mystical qualities of the sword, a sword of wisdom, a sword for contemplation, a sword for uh, the inner strength of someone. So I based the design on the number seven, Again, a flirt with tradition. Um, this sword is made and in the ownership of a, of a, a friend and customer of mine. He's published these um, facts already, so th this is why I share them with you. Otherwise, these designs are intended to be for the owner only. That's my intention anyway. That goes with the sword. Every sword comes with its own secret that is revealed to its owner. This sword was based, as I said, on the number seven. Within the circle, there is a seven-pointed star. I can construct a square around the circle. And again, from the very first disposition you saw, we can then establish a length, a total length and a division between hilt and blade. So we get sort of a basic proportion for a sword. Now. I can draw a circle in the inner corners of this seven-pointed star, and from that circle I can construct a vesica. It projects the length of the sword a little bit outside the square. Um, I draw an inner circle into the middle of the seven-pointed star, and between the point of the vesica and this inner circle I can construct a second vesica, and this will be the foundation for the pommel shape. Now I need to establish the height of the, p of the guard. I do that, no, this is, the w sorry, this is the width of the blade that is defined by the, dif the um, distance between the um, guard and the edge of the square. That gives us sort of a, a basic feeling for the, the dimension or a proportion of the blade. And by projecting the uh, outer circle via the, the mid of the cross guard, we get the thickness of the guard. So now it's possible to do a complete design of this sword 
based on these proportions. So the final sword doesn't have to be so geometrical or strict or, or sort of stark as just the basic geometric forms. Again, you created like a grid for yourself and within this grid you're of course completely free to act. So limits will free you. Limits creates an area where you're free to act completely to your whim. And you know that what you will do will still come to rest as a wholeness of things. And the final sword looks like this. It's made from, from uh, polished monosteel. It's, it's sort of rather stark. There's nothing embellished except for some silver details. I used uh, fine silver and wrought iron that is etched and darkened to give this uh, image of, of, of light in darkness, an, an image of, of perhaps the light you see in contemplation, something that has to do with, with inner reflection. And uh, to me that was a very satisfying project because I could work with this as a swordsmith working within a tradition but completely free in my artistic choices. I was not limited to make a replica of an existing sword to be sure that I was making a proper sword. I knew I could fulfill the dynamic aspects of what a sword should be of this type and I can now approach it as a timeless piece of metal art that is also a, 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 a real sword in every aspect and because of this has to be approached with a certain sense of gravitas or respect if you like. Or not, if you don't care about these things. But, but I do think that the sword is a central object to us. I do think that the sword is central in our culture and that by just making a mockery of it in, in, in um, cliché fantasy depictions, we make a mockery of something within ourselves that I think we should respect. We have both darkness and light within ourselves and, and the sword is an image of these two things. And it's a good thing to contemplate on, on it. it it's, it's something I think that is sobering and makes life much more interesting. So I will end my presentation here of, of this theory and I, I really thank you for your attention. Um, are there any questions? Do you have time for questions? Okay. Imagine that uh, you can't tell with the old blades that are now corroded and missing material, but do you suspect that there could be any relationships between the sacred geometry and now perhaps the nodes and balance points and perhaps the, w the weight distributions? Mm. Now, can we start taking that into account and thank ask? You. I thank you for that question because that's very, very crucial. Sometimes when I do the analysis of, of the proportions, it so happens that the, the, the point of balance is, is smack on the golden section from the hilt length or from the original square. Hmm. But I'm inclined to think that is mostly a coincidence. <laughs> because if it's not, it's really quite astounding could it be perhaps a, a natural result? It could be a natural result in that way that the overall proportions of a sword will have an effect on where the balance point will tend to be. But it's not going to be that exact that it's always going to be here because that mm. will depend on slight changes in width and, and thickness. It's once you have deci des decided on the shape and form of the sword, you're still completely free to work in the third dimension. And I, you know, I think it's difficult to, st to believe that they designed also the volume of the sword in this way. You can, you c absolutely, you right. can. Yeah. But the question is, did they really do that? I'm not so sure, because I think that this art, this tradition that I outlined for you now, was not the skill of the bladesmith. This is the skill of, skill of the man who, who planned the overall project, and that tended to be a sword cutler or the entrepreneur. He could perhaps be a swordsmith in some, some cases, but as I understand it, this is typically the, the, the work of the cutler 
who then subcontracts the blade making, the hilt making, the scabbard making, the belt making to other craftsmen. But he, he is responsible for this product to come together just so. Mm -hmm. So he would be inclined to, to send out specifications. It's difficult to think he did not. Mm -hmm. Because he has to make sure that the cross guards he gets will fit the blades he gets. Sure. So he has to, to be able to somehow define what he's going to get. And, or not, but if, if he didn't care about those things, then swords would carry no aesthetic qualities. There would be no resonance of proportions in them. And I think it's quite impossible to believe you could even make usable swords from pieces that were just put mm -hmm. together in any just uh, haphazard way. So already by establishing a guild or a class of sword cutlers, you have someone who will approach this product, this making, as a designer, as an engineer. And we know from, uh, there, there is um, uh, records from the 16th century where swordsmiths in Ma Milan made contracts to each other saying, well, I take your son as my apprentice and I promise him housing and this and that and perhaps some pocket money and I will learn him my trade for seven years or whatever. Uh, and there could be a clause saying that, and I will also teach him the art of drawing for two hours each week, or perhaps mm -hmm. two hours every day. We have documents exactly like that. Mm -hmm. So we know by the, the, at least in this case in Milan in the 16th century, the art of drawing was part of the skill of the sword cutler. And this is sort of taken for granted because we have the Renaissance and everything lovely happens in the Renaissance, as everyone knows. The thing is that these ideas are just a, a late blooming of, of seeds that were planted much, much, much earlier. Mm. And they were coming to fruition much, much earlier. Mm. So, so things that are accredited to the Renaissance are very often the case already established way further back in time than that. And I do believe that sword makers from the very, very beginning were absolutely interested in proportion, although they wouldn't have used exactly this strict structure for, for design. But I wouldn't be surprised if geometry or some kind of ideas of proportions played a role in the sword making in other time periods and cultures as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have I've done a little bit of exploration in other areas, but I haven't got enough data to say anything meaningful, really, other than some bronze swords are really remarkable when you look at their proportions. Mm. Uh, um, cool. Thank I you. I Thank you. A, I have a question about that, Peter. When you look at um, the Latin scroll work, those, the, 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 the spirals and stuff, yes, those yes. are incredibly complex. They must they have been using compasses. They did. We know so, that. Yes. I know, you know? <laughs> I know, <laughs> but I have I have documented so few Celtic swords, yeah. and as a rule, nothing remains of their hilts. So we only have the blade to go by. It's a very limited amount of data yeah. to do any meaningful analysis from. But you could look for modules. You could look for something a relationship between the blade and the scabbard, possibly. But, but, the, but the material is so fragmented, so it's difficult to yeah. say. But, I mean, you could look at the, just the layout of the design, and I'm sure you're going to see, uh, again, what is typical for Celtic art is that you have a rather sort of strict framework, and again, within that framework, they were very carefree and, and free-spirited, and, and let's go like this, but still, you, uh, it appears as a regular rhythm of forms. So, I, I wouldn't be surprised. But, I mean, even looking at, like, we went to document swords at the Wallace collection mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and then we went and documented swords at the British Museum and we looked at the big sword that you showed at the beginning yes the, I can't remember the name of it but that it's a seven four seven huge huge yes huge, <laughs> it's a huge, it's a huge sword. it's ridiculous yes and then we documented these tiny little latin blades and yes. that that little one of those latin blades yes. the, the proportions yes. of that blade yes were so similar to yes. the, this, this yes. bigger, much, yeah. much yes. bigger sword. Yes. And the thing is with these things, that when, when you have, once you've established proportions like this, the object seems to sing its own quiet music. It hums with it itself, this little secret tune. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, I find this extremely interesting. And it's so difficult to get at. You know, how do you do this? You, you do this in a beautiful way by intuition, because 
we are attracted to these proportions. This is, this is a known thing by among, we've talked about this here these days, but some really prefer a very intuitive approach to this, and, and you, you do it just so until you get it right, and um, you, you, you can establish proportions that, that will have meaningful relationship to each other. So yes, we can do that without using geometry, but I think that the medieval way to do it was to use geometry, because we see that in other arts. Um, and just like we, we learn in art training, by if we free figure drawing, to be, to be capable draftsmen, we, we have to learn to see things in different ways. We should look for the outside form or the inside form, to, to look at the contour or the volume, and by changing our way to look at an object as we're drawing it, we will get a richer understanding of it and we will get a better capability of depicting it. Uh, geometry in the, in the use of design is just another perspective, another approach. It, it can free us because we can establish pleasing proportions very directly. And then within those proportions we are then free to, to work very intuitively. Uh, so I find it to be a very powerful design tool like that. Um, and it strikes me, I didn't really answer your question, Joel. Um, did they define volume? I think that just like this geometry may have been a secret art among cutlers, the, the, the way you define a sword blade, the way you, you distribute mass in a sword blade could well be a secret among bladesmiths, who they may not be very keen on you know, sharing with the cutlers because their trade was separate. They knew their thing. They did their thing. You could absolutely make a blade to, to answer to length and width and perhaps even weight. And then you make it into a good, well-balanced sword. Yes? We have uh, several hundred people online that want to ask you a question. And okay. We've had it, we, and uh, they're feeling ignored. Okay. Uh, so, I, so, <laughs> okay. so um, we've, we've, we have them, Re read aloud. We have them ver verbally waving their hands, saying, me, okay. me, 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 me. Uh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, well, let's but, do that. Uh, at any rate, I, I think this actually does relate to the question uh, that Jake asked, but mm -hmm. because he asked it from the perspective of a very educated uh, person in terms of the sword, he, th it maybe needed to be answered in more plain language. The question was, do, would swords that were made before the medieval period mm. be used on these design principles? Um, or be based on these design principles, right? They may, they may. Um, in the case of the medieval sword, um, we know structures of design that are contemporary in the plan of cathedrals and in the layout of artwork such as books or sculptures. So we can see a direct parallel with the, the structures I think I find in, in swords with known structures that we, we see from art. So we have a direct correlation there. It's not a proof, but it's a very, very strong indication that this is actually the case. When we come to earlier periods, we know even less but we can, we can use a study of geometry in trying to understand the th design process or the thoughts of design in the making of these objects. And the compass is a very evident and, and obvious tool in the toolbox of many artisans. So it's not the exclusive property of the medieval artisan. So because of that, if you have the compass, if you have the straight edge, you will tend to be using it in the layout of design. But I wouldn't think that you find exactly the same structures to the same, uh, and absolutely not with the same symbolical meaning that you'll find in the, in the medieval sword, but it's absolutely possible that you'll find geometry. I mean, look at the, um, the, the ring fort of, of Trelleborg. That is, in my analysis, that builds on a system of, of Vesica arcs. Very, very powerfully so. Um, uh, I can't say that certainty because I only have sort of second source material of its dimensions, but at the, at the very sort of I preliminary analysis, the, these Viking period fortifications are very much an example of quadrature and vesica geometry. Um, I've analyzed a spearhead from the Anglo-Saxon England belonging to the, I think, early 9th century, which is a beautiful example of quadrature 
and um, uh, a symmetry building on three circles. It even incorporates a cross in the exact division between the first and second circle. It's, it's difficult to believe it wasn't consciously planned like that. Uh, I've found striking uh, cases of symmetry and proportion in Bronze Age swords. One uh, from not far f found not far from where I live in, um, uh, in a place called um, um, Bragby. It's a, there, it was a sword sacrificed from 1600 BC that is just astounding in how both simply and sut subtly it is designed in its proportions in a way that it's difficult to think, you know, believe it, was, it wasn't intentional. Uh, so yes, it's definitely possible that uh, thoughts of proportion and intentions in design was a part in the making of, of weapons from a very, very early time. And since the sword is such a special object, almost sacred in any culture, it, it belongs to this kind of traditional thinking that has to do with building of temple and observation of the heavenly bodies. I mean, it, it has its... Its world is so close, both in symbolic value and in social status, that it would be difficult to think it was like, you know, non-communicating vessels. We have, a, we have actually a kind of an interesting question from online. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that to sound dismissive like the rest of the questions were yes. interesting. Have there been other geometric patterns like this found in non-sword weapons of the age, such as axes or spears or halberds? Well, the thing is that this kind of analysis of proportions in, in swords hasn't been done before. Right. This is new. What I'm proposing is a completely new theory. Swords have never been studied like this before. And, and rarely works of art, because geometric analysis of art is also fraught with a lot of dangers. Just as I said in the beginning, if you look for a pattern, you will tend to find it, because we are so good at finding patterns, and, if we, and it's so pleasing when we do find it. Um, so we have to restrain ourselves also in this, in this search, because it can easily be overblown and, and which can try to prove way too much, and then it becomes a sort of a Dan Brown thing, where everything fits together in this beautiful puzzle. And that is going too far. But I do think that just ignoring the fact that conscious thought and design on a rather advanced level was involved in the making of, of weapons, that would definitely be a mistake, because we would making them into something that is much less than that what they are. I have not made a, an analysis of axis, but as I said, this spearhead from um, uh, Anglo-Saxon England, that was a beautiful example of geometry. I do think that we will find it primarily in those weapons that carry a very important sim symbolical status yep. and made by specialist craftsmen. That is, that, those are the sort of uh, the basic situation where you can expect to find something like this. It doesn't make it automatically that it would be the case, but you would have someone who would be part of a, of a strong tradition working with objects that are that need this kind of, of um, support to, to fulfill their, their potential. Because the, 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 the function of the sword is not just to, to kill someone, it's also to carry its symbolical burden and really carry through that message. And, and if you're going to do that in the medieval period, you will have to work with meaningful tools, which one is geometry. Uh, another question from online, a, a good one that you actually touched on, your Ashokan lecture. Um, and the question was, uh, it's, it said something about the fact that uh, old fighting manuals often said that swords should be built around the proportions of their intended user. Yes. Um, and can this theory of proportions be applied with that Of course it can. Of course <clears throat> it can. Just as I say, a, a geometrical design is unlimited in dimension. You can make a design that is half size or, or, or whatever fits your, your drawing medium. Like, uh, I, c I can make a saw design on, 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 the, on the board here. This will be very clumsy, but you'll get the idea. I make it to a size that is useful for the kind of detail I want, for the kind of definition I want in, in the design. So say I, I make a, a, a design for a long sword that, that is like this. Uh, you get the idea, I hope. So 
Then comes the customer and asks, sir, um, so you want a long sword, how long should it be? And he says, well, I want it to be this long. And I take a piece of string, I measure this out carefully, and I judge that my drawing is roughly a quarter of his intended length. So I take this piece of string, I fold it once, and I fold it twice, and now I have a quarter of his intended size. I compare that to my drawing. Oops, a little bit too long. Hmm, what to do? Well, let's do like this. I, I take this piece of string that is too long, and I, I, I hold it here, I fold it up until it meets right angles to my drawing. Now, I have a way to multiply every part in my design to his exact size. I can take the width of the guard and place it here, and now I have the width of his guard, but a quarter of it. So I take my compass and I walk it. Okay, it should be exactly that long. So you have no limits to quarters of inches or half millimeter. You can work to exact size outside the limit of numbers based on geometry. And if this says, well, that makes the hilt way too long in proportion to the blade, then you just vary the number of circles and get a shorter grip or a longer grip. And the, another power with this is that it's fairly easy to memorize these structures. You can carry a whole notebook of designs in your head. I know a sword is eight circles, it's the first inscribed square and the half diagonal there, and I know I get the pommel by this cut. So this makes it a very, we know also they were very good at this art of memorization. So it's an extremely powerful design tool. You have this whole catalog of sort of potential designs ready to use. And you can draw them out if you need to, and, and then use them as a, as a basis for further design development. So you can absolutely use this in a very flexible way to meet rather specific needs for hilt to blade length and total size. So yes, it's absolutely use, possible to, to use this to adjust the design to the specifics of an individual customer. Wonderful. And this, I've told them, this is the, going to be the last question because we do have to wrap and you've been going for quite a while. Um, it, it, this is a very broad, sweeping question. And so it, it takes us a little bit further from the sword specifically and more towards general philosophy, I suppose you could say. But the question is, is this geometric proportion, this emphasis on uh, numbers, a cultural one, you think, or one that is deeply ingrained in the race? In other words, is this as a result of the particular culture of the medieval, the influence of the church, and so on? Or is this something that you think, outside of those parameters, we would have come to anyway, <laughs> because there's something inherent in the aesthetics that speaks to us as people inherently? Well, this is something that should really be answered <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> by an art historian or an idea historian. But uh, geometry has been important for just about any culture and it's been a tool of understanding the world for just about any culture. To what amount this has been used in the design of specific weapons, this is an open question and if we do ascribe credibility to my theory, it actually opens a completely new field in the study of the history of arms and armor because we can start to look at them from a perspective of design and, and intentional um, aesthetics that may even be uh, a, a carrier of meaning. Not, it doesn't have to be meaning, but it can be, because geometry has all, often been ascribed also to symbolic meaning. And I'm not saying that the swordsmith is um, a geometer and the swordsmith is a philosopher, but he worked in a world where these ideas were of crucial importance. Mm -hmm. And it, wouldn't be, it would be difficult not to be influenced by it directly or indirectly. His customers would be men who studied geometry, um, and they would be interested in these criteria. Uh, the guild of, of swordsmiths or um, uh, cutlers, they may be working in a place that was like in Passau. The, the sword, sword industry in Passau was run by the bishop of Passau. 
So he would be making certain that the product that left his uh, his um, um, his workshops would meet up to the highest level of quality, and he would understand that from his perspective. So if the swords of Passau were made with geometry as an important element in the design, would only be natural. Um, so in, in other cases of history, in other places, uh, other cultures, we have to look at that individually to see if, to what degree that may influence uh, the design of weapons. But it's a really, really interesting question. Um, so um, let's continue down that path and see what we find. Great. Great. I think a big round of applause for you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Dave. Well, that I told you, right? I mean, I know, right? So uh, this concludes uh, the formal elements of Arctic Fire 2012. I think you will agree we ended this on a bang. Um, <laughs> anyway, guys, we will see you tomorrow. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll, uh, uh, please, if you missed anything, the media archive at arcticfire2012.com will be updated shortly. Thanks again.